So my name is Mark Ferrari, and uh, I am going to start with a little slideshow of uh, some of my previous work, because I'm not assuming that a lot of you know who I am. I think you're probably here because you're interested in 8-bit and 8-bitish art, whatever that is, and you're probably saying, yeah, and Mark Ferrari, who is that? So uh, I uh, started with Lucasfilm Games when I was... Excuse me? Oh, right. I'm supposed to press this button. There we go. Um, I started with Lucasfilm Games when I, before you were any of you born, and we made everything with this palette, those 16 colors, and this is what the art looked like. We didn't just have those 16 colors for this game. The entire industry had those specific 16 colors to do every game they did. Those 16 colors were arrived at by well-intentioned programmers who simply slid the RGB numbers to even intervals and said, look how symmetrical, how balanced we're done. And the rest of us were left to do the crying and the cleanup. So when I was hired at Lucasfilm, we couldn't even dither these colors because dither didn't compress in those days. So I did the best I could to, to do this. And then we went on to dither. I had a little something to do with this. Uh, I put up some pictures on screen one day after we were done with Zach McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders, which those things were just from. And I said, you know, if we used dither, uh, our pictures could look like this. And believe it or not, this was a lot better. So uh, inspired by that, um, we learned how to compress dither thanks to Ron Gilbert, who is sitting in this room someplace. And we made a game where you could actually have six or seven different kinds of blue, uh, rather than just four, because of the fact that we could dither it. This was all EGA. It was all, as you can see, very low resolution. And this game actually won graphics awards. Some people actually thought it was a VGA game because they'd never seen EGA graphics look like this. When we were done with that, we went on to make a game called Secret of Mo The Secret of Monkey Island, which some of you have probably heard of. Um, the Secret of Monkey Island, we really got the use of dither down. In The Secret of Monkey Island, we could have places that looked a lot less flat than those Zach McCracken environments. We could have real sunsets in EGA. We could have atmospheric perspective. We could have depth of field still in EGA. We could render sand so that it looked a little bit like sand and not like a large yellow spot that someone had forgotten to color in. It was exciting and inspirational for us artists. And then we moved on from there. Um, I'm going to now just put on a slideshow of other 256 color eight bit art I have done. Everything you're seeing now was done eight bit. This is not eight bitish art yet. I'll get to that in a minute. And this is stuff that I have done since then. This was for the very last GBA Spyro game ever made, as far as I know. Um, this is what I've been doing. And while this is showing, I would like to talk a little bit about the reason I am so, and remained so interested in 8-bit, 256 color, limited palette art, even after there was any technological or game design imperative to use it. I am interested in it because it was so incredibly limited. I don't actually have any desire to do EGA art ever again in my life, but I will say that the most creative work I ever did was done when I just had those 16 horrible colors to do it in. If somebody gives you two gum wrappers and three sticks and tells you to make the pieta with this, you will take two gum wrappers and three sticks as far as they can possibly go in, in your effort to accomplish your mission. If somebody gives you all the artistic resources of the universe and says, make the pieta with this, you will dabble in all of those resources until the time is up and you have made nothing at all. 
I think this is one of the challenges that's been facing our industry for some time, is that the resources are so many now, they are so vast, and they replace themselves and render themselves obsolete so quickly that nobody has the time to do anything but just dabble for a moment in the current resource du jour before it's gone, and they are busy scrambling to learn just the merest proficiency of the next one. Back in these days, I was able to work with Deluxe Paint 2 by Electronic Arts for 10 years before I had to give that up and go on to the next art tool. And during that 10 years, I was able to do things with Deluxe Paint that I don't think even EA ever imagined would be done with Deluxe Paint. I'm gonna get out of this for a moment and show you some of what I ended up doing with Deluxe Paint. All of the animation that you see in these scenes right now is done with color cycling. There are no frames here. There's no extra pieces of art. This is actually an HTML5 color cycling emulator created by Joe Huckabee, whom I will mention a little bit later, so that anybody could see these pieces. These were done for software products that have been dead for ages until Joe learned how to show them happening on the web, and then they became pretty widely seen and pretty widely liked. So here are snowflakes falling on a picture. There is no actual transparency here. This is one layer of 8-bit art with apparently transparent snowflakes falling in it. Here's waterfall and rain. I will be talking just a little bit later about specifically how I did some of these effects in an 8-bit environment. Today, Deluxe Paint 2 is barely usable even in a DOS emulator, as you will see when I try to use it in a DOS emulator in just a little while. The only real tool for producing true 8-bit art that I know of out there right now is a, a program many of you probably know called Promotion. I am actually very grateful to Cosmigo for doing all that he has done to keep an 8-bit tool alive and functioning out there, but I have to say there are a number of things D-Paint did that promotion does and doesn't, um, and, there, and some of them are pretty important. Right now, I'm not sure that there are uh, ways to do some of what I did these pictures with in D-Paint, which is what these were all done in D-Paint. However, I will say that Joe Huckabee hopes to have a product ready to look at sometime next year that does all of this again and at the higher resolutions you want. So those of you who are really waiting for a tool you can do stuff like this in, in 8-bit will probably have it sometime next year. In the meantime, I'm left to ask myself, as people uh, invite me to talk here, why we are so interested in 8-bit art when, in fact, there's so little way to produce it anymore and so few really integrally compelling reasons to be doing 8-bit art in today's gaming universe. And I have pretty much come to the conclusion that most of you are probably here because you just love this aesthetic because maybe some of you remember playing games that looked and felt like this when you were younger before the very cinemagraphic first-person shooters that we mostly play today came along. Maybe some of you really love 8-bit because you've never seen anything like this, being much younger and not have played these games back or these, used these products back when they were made. Whatever your reasons, I'm going to assume that you're here for inspiration about thinking about 8-bit art. And the first thing I want to say along those lines is that for me, 8-bit art is all about an environment that is small enough to be creative in. What can you think to do with pixels and with a limited palette? The great thing about a limited palette is that you can use it, you can manipulate it. It isn't just there, a giant ineffable cloud like the 32-bit universe that provides whatever is called for. You can actually go in and fool around. What you're seeing over there on the right-hand side of these things is, uh, your right-hand side, I assume, is the palette operating. So you can see what parts are actually cycling and what parts aren't. 
Once I figured out how to do effects like these with color cycling, I went on to figure out how we could do more with an 8-bit environment. So here we're going to see some of those same scenes. So what you're going to see now does not involve any extra frames of art either. Not a single animation frame, not a single second piece of art. What you're seeing now is all done simply by changing palettes on this one picture. Once I figured out how to rotate palette positions to create the sense of animation for almost any environmental effect I could think of, I started trying to figure out how to make the whole picture change by constructing it so that using palettes we could get it at any time of day in virtually any weather condition. I'm flipping quickly forward to get you some of the more interesting ones. Actually, that was an interesting one. These were for a product that put these, originally put these pictures up on screen 24 hours. And any time you looked at your screen, it was the same time of day in the picture that it was outside your actual windows. And all done with palette shifting. Now I'm going to show you another little trick with palette shifting that I figured out in extremis about seven or eight, maybe ten years ago, I can't remember. So we were doing a game for one of these little, you plug it into your TV, the game is in the controller things. It was an X-Men game. And suddenly, after all these years, storage and processing time and all the rest of that really was an issue. So we needed to cram as much art as we could in as little space as possible. So we had this, this game, it was a storm game, the, uh, the character Storm, she fights people off while flying through the air. So we needed a lot of backgrounds. These backgrounds were all designed to scan line parallax, so they were whizzing by underneath you in a kind of perspective. And we needed as many of these environments as we could, but we didn't really have much space. So here's a valley scene. Imagine Storm is flying along up here. First of all, we wanted these scenes at different times of day. So I just used the same old palette uh, tricks you've already seen to, uh, I'm going to load a palette now. So there we are at sunset. And then I'm going to load another palette now. And there we are at night. You'll notice that some clouds changed and disappeared in there. But we also needed other environments. So now I'm going to load another palette. And we'll just get rid of those hills and all those trees. And now we're up in the stratosphere looking down at clouds. I'm going to load another palette here. Here we are at sunset. Here we are at night. But we really wanted some diversity, too. The clever observer can still see those trees in there. They look like clouds now, but they're still trees. So. Can we do anything more with palettes? Well, okay, let's do something really different. How about that? I did not change the picture. I just changed the palette. And uh, here's that palette in the evening. Oh, nope, nope, sorry, wrong palette. Cloud, city, they look the same. Here's that city in the evening. Here's that city at night. So there are basically three scenes at three times of day in this one piece of art. And I will be talking a little later about how I do that as well. Um, again, it's not so much that I expect you to run out and do palette shift effects like this or color cycling effects like this. It's just there was so much more to do with a palette that you could control color by color, that you could fiddle with the positions of things, that there was so much more you could do because the environment was small enough that you could actually think about it that way. 
And I think that that is probably part of the reason why 8-bit and 8-bitish art is still so relevant today is because it was a mentally and creatively manageable space to work in, which I'm not sure a lot of our other much more cinemagraphic and three-dimensional things are quite the same. And because it wasn't going to evolve so quickly that as soon as you began to figure out what was going on, everything had changed and you had to start over. Before I talk about any of that, however, I think the real reason I am here today is probably because I have been given the tremendous honor and uh, really enjoyable uh, opportunity to work with Ron Gilbert, Gary Winnick, and David Fox uh, on a game called Thimbleweed Park. And uh, I'm going to put on a slideshow now while I talk about, uh, about that. Let's see here. There we go. So these are some backgrounds that I'm doing now for Thimbleweed Park. Uh, about a year ago, recognizing that there were a lot of people out there with a deep hunger for 8-bit and 8-bitish games, after all this time, uh, Ron and Gary decided to try a Kickstarter where they basically told people, if you'll fund us, we will do a game like the Lucasfilm Adventure games that you used to play in the late 80s as if you bought one and just found it now, that re realized you never opened it, unwrapped it, and started to play. Um, if you heard about the Thimbleweed Kickstarter at all, you know that it was very, very, very successful. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars raised in 30 days, and that indicated there was interest. So they've been doing that game. They have invited me to do the backgrounds for that game because I was the guy that did backgrounds for a lot of the games that people are remembering so nostalgically when they do it. However, as we really began thinking about what specifically to draw, we realized that while people have a marvelous memory of playing these games when they were young, some people at least, they might not actually want exactly what would have been produced in 1987. I remind you of the, the first slides I showed of the EGA palette and the artwork we made with it. If people sat down to an EGA game right now with solid colors like they would really have gotten in 1987, it might have been going, like going to a Renaissance fair and finding yourself in the actual Renaissance with sewage flowing in the streets and people with hideous deformities and everybody smelling like people really smelled in the Renaissance. They might prefer the Renaissance fair. So what we have decided to attempt to do is provide a game that feels just like people remember these games feeling and plays a lot like they remember them playing, except that Ron and Gary and, and David Fox have had decades to learn from the way they put those games together. So now, not only are we tweaking the art a little so that it's Renaissance Fair, not the actual Renaissance, they have also had the chance to tweak the game design, the interface, all of those things, so that they look and feel just like you remember them feeling, but all of the things you didn't like about those earlier games have now been amended. They play more intuitively, they don't frustrate in the ways that they, some of the earlier games might have frustrated, and they don't force you to look at EGA, and yet it, you can see the pixels. It looks pretty 256 colorish. So this is not 8-bit art. This is being done in Photoshop, and it is being done to feel like VGA 8-bit graphics. I don't actually count colors. I'm sure there's many times 256 colors in some of these pictures. Again, I decided that, we all decided, I think, that what we wanted to do is the art we would like to have made in those days in a way that feels like the art we did in those days. That is what I mean by 8-bit-ish art. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how I'm doing that as well. And I have all sorts of demos that I can show you, but for the sake of brevity, I actually, I, let me see a show of hands. How many people here would rather hear me talk about what I'm doing with the 8-bit-ish art now or how many people would like me to talk more about how I did those things with color cycling and palette shifting in an actual index color tool? So, 8-bit-ish art now, raise your hands if you want me to start with that. Okay, 8-bit color cycling and... Okay, I admire you, you, you poor little remnant of people who actually wants to hear about 8-bit art, but I guess I will start with Thimbleweed Park then. Um, so... Basically, 
Let me... Okay. Where did I put them? Okay. So, I start by just doing a sketch like this. Oh, you don't want to see it that way. There we go. So this is just done with the brush tool. I'm just laying out the room and giving myself some quick indication of what's going to be in the room. And if I'm not sure something's actually going to fit at resolution, I actually draw it in hard pixels so that I make sure that we can actually put a machine with all of these features. You know, Ron will sometimes give me 10 whole pixels of space and tell me that he wants the thing to have mechanical arms and a keyboard and uh, a place for the uh, keys to show and paper coming out of it and um, 15 lines of poetry in Aramaic. Uh, and I have to figure out how to do that in 10 pixels. So I, I will now and then make sure it's possible before I start. Um, once I... Uh, let me actually do this slideshow style. Pardon the delay here. Things I didn't anticipate. Okay. So, then I will start just coloring the room in, trying to get a better sense of the space. And then I start making these templates. This is how I actually light the room. I will create a pool of light. I will create a bunch of them wherever there's supposed to be light on the wall. And then I will use magic wand uh, selections on those things and start just using color balance to add yellow to the wall. And I'll start with the center circle and then I'll add a little bit more yellow and then I'll go to the first, the, the center and the next circle out and add a little bit more yellow and, you know, or blue or green or red or whatever. But basically I'm using color balance to add light with and using selections to do it. It is very important to turn every possible box to nearest neighbor. You have to do that in general preferences. You have to do that in free transform. You have to do that in image size. There's, there's so many places to turn every, to the interpolation to, to nearest neighbor. You have to turn anti-aliasing off on every tool you're going to use. Your selections cannot be aliased. Your pencil cannot be aliased. Your fills cannot be aliased. Everywhere you can find an anti-alias box, you have to turn it off. You're probably going to be using the pencil tool almost exclusively if you want to do 8-bit-ish art in Photoshop. Um, there are ways to do uh, anti-aliasing a little more easily than in the old days. Uh, so here's a jaggedy line that I want to anti-alias. I will make a selection of that line I will move it over one. I will press Alt and remove all of that selection that is still covering the line. And then I'll just adjust the color. I'm going to hide the selection so that I can see what I'm doing. And I will just, every now and then Photoshop tells me something I know, just to make sure. And I'll adjust the color. And then bringing that selection back, I'll just move it over one. And I'll adjust the color. And in this way, I can very quickly adjust all those jags at once. I'm doing this with a mouse now at home. I work on a 21-inch Cintiq, which is a lot less awkward than doing this with a mouse, I have to say. So. When I'm done, and then I'll do this up above as well, and when I'm done, I quickly have anti-aliased that whole line without going through one pixel at a time. But an awful lot of this still needs to be done one pixel at a time. Uh, so we've had to make some other decisions too. We started out by, uh, we started out with a lot of dither. Let me find the radio station here. So. In the old days, I was sort of the dither guy. I was the one that convinced everybody that dither was a better way to do DGA, and then I just kept doing it 
in VGA. So you can see all of this dither in these walls. Um, virtually all of that was actually placed one pixel at a time. I used the pencil tool to stamp down all of those things in these funny patterns. That turned out to be not very viable. We have way more backgrounds than you've seen. There are going to be way more. By the way, all the artwork you're seeing here is in progress. A lot of it isn't even fully colored in yet. It's all subject to change. I just want to do that caveat as we're looking at it. So we decided to go with bands of color instead. So an awful lot of our rooms now, going back to Dolores' room, you can see that rather than dither, I am just doing concentric bands of color. This is how we're shading things. This is something there's actually time to do times the dozens and dozens and dozens, or possibly hundreds of backgrounds. I'm never sure when Ron is going to give up and cut it out. Every time I think I'm caught up, he comes up with another great idea. It's like one of those anxiety dreams where every time you reach the front door of the haunted mansion and are about to run outside, it opens onto a new hallway full of twice as many ghosts. It's a marvelous experience. I want to make that clear, Ron, wherever you are, I'm very happy to be doing it. But um, uh, So we are, we are now using banded color rather than dithered color. Uh, as I mentioned, we are no longer holding ourselves exclusively uh, to 256 colors. In fact, I'm not even holding myself exclusively to 1,500 colors if I need to. We just want to make sure that it looks like it and feels like it but don't actually go counting the colors. So I'm going to go ahead and show this slideshow now. And before I go on to talking more about real 8-bit techniques, all of you who have come here to talk about 8-bitish art, I'm hoping that perhaps you have questions. And we're going to take 10 or 15 minutes right now to give you a chance to ask those questions. There are mics there and there in the aisle. If you have a question, if you could please come to the nearest of those mics and ask it, I would be happy to answer them. Um, I've told you some of the, the most basic things, the importance of nearest neighbor, the importance of turning off anti-aliasing, the importance of using selections. I find it's much easier to fill any color in and then use either the color balance or the hue value saturation controls to slide a bar around and find the color you want than it is to go into the palette and try and find the right color or make the right color like you might have done in an earlier tool. So I'm going to start here and then just go back and forth. So what's your question? So as you grew as an artist using tools that were newer and newer and using techniques that you were and others were developing, would you say that your taste in 8-bit-ish art changed from 8-bit? Or do you think that your taste is, was pretty solid and that's just the tools have changed? Um, most of the artwork that I have done for the past 10 or 15 years has been 32-bit high-resolution artwork for all sort concept art and game art and art for various public applica publishing applications. That's where my art went. Because when Gary Winnick first met me and asked me if I wanted to work for Lucasfilm, my first comment to him was, I would love to work for Lucasfilm, but I am a dyed-in-the-wool technophobe who's never touched a computer, and I'm not sure I'm the guy for you. And Gary's response was, we find it's easier to hire artists and teach them to use computers than it is to find computer technicians and teach them to be artists. Mm -hmm. I would say that the EGA palette is proof of that. <laughs> um, so that's what he did, and the rest is kind of history. Uh, but the truth is, I have always primarily been in it for the art. Um, I am not a big gamer. I am certainly not a tech person to this day. I'm pretty much an artist. So as the tools allowed us to do more and more art, I did more and more art. However, as I said earlier, I have never had as much fun creatively as I did figuring out how to take this tool further and do things with it that made the pictures better, even things that nobody ever actually saw coming. So I really, I enjoyed the creative experience of using limited color palette more than I actually enjoy the, the contemporary tools. But I like the product that I'm getting out a lot of the contemporary tools. I like the fact that I can take those images everywhere I want to take them without constraint. So it's a yes or no answer. Yeah, thank yes. You. Yeah, um, what I'm trying to uh, ask you here is like, um, I see the, the, the 8 bit dish um, artwork you're doing right now, and I think it's uh, biggest uh, strength. Um, actually, all of your art, it's biggest strength is the color itself. So um, do you have any tips uh, as of 
if, if it's good to start with pixel art or if you should like do oils and other sort of traditional media to learn about color and how to reach that sort of uh, color harmony in your work because that, that's really what shines here for me. Well, that's a really good question. Thank you for asking it. Um, one of the biggest challenges, I think, in this age of digital art is that lots of people both administrators and employers and even artists themselves think that we have created tools that somehow do some or all of the art for you. And that is not true. Um, when I was working at a software contractor, a fairly large one in Seattle a number of years ago, I was asked to mentor a number of young artists, a lot of them coming straight to us from places like DigiPen, you know, in their very early 20s. And I was working with one of those artists, too, who's a really very good artist these days. In fact, he's, he's probably one of the most important artistic assets of his company at all. But he was trying to do, in a 3D environment, he was trying to do uh, a desert scene where there was bright sunlight on these structures, and he wanted the shadows to have that sort of dark, cool look that they have, but he couldn't make it look right. Everything was just looking like big blobs of spilled ink. So he asked me to come over and tell him, you know, how can I fix this? And I said, well, I think you just need to ask yourself, you know, where is the light in those shadows coming from? And he said, the secondary light source. <laughs> and I said, no. I mean, he pointed at the interface. There's the secondary <laughs> light source right there on that little globe. No, no. I mean, those aren't black, so there's light in them from somewhere. They're shadows, so it's not the same thing that's lighting up all the sunlit parts. Where does the light in a shadow come from? And he pointed to the color wheel. <laughs> And I realized, oh my God, he, he doesn't understand. I'm asking questions about the world. He thinks I'm asking questions about his tool. And eventually we got to the point where he remembered to think while working in this 3D interface, he remembered to think about a planet where the star casts a warm yellow light and the sky radiates a blue interference and it's that blue skylight that is filling any light you see in a shadow. And so the shadows, are, so we started, once he started thinking about the real world and how light functions out here, he was able to answer his own questions and do this thing. But sometimes people don't think past the tool. All of which is a long way of saying, you still need art skills to do art in any digital environment. If you don't know what you're trying to do and understand how it's done outside of that digital environment, it's very unlikely you're going to make the tool do that part for you. You've got to know what you're attempting to do. So yes, it's great to learn as much about art outside digital tools as you can. And if you're going to learn art inside digital tools, which more and more of us are going to do these days, you need to first use them as virtual traditional media kinds of tools, not as technical rendering tools, because until you can do what you're trying to do with traditional media, you're going to have a very hard time doing that in digital media. Yeah. Having said that, there are some things about using even digital media that I will just quickly say. First of all, um, in some of these outdoor scenes, like this Vista scene or some of the street scenes that you've, that you've seen there, it is very important for me, like this, it's very important for me to do the sky and the background landscape first. I can't, uh, let me get out of this just for a minute and actually pull up one of these street scenes and show you what it looks like with the sky turned off. So, where is B Street? Okay, so, oh, these are JPEGs. Sorry. I rearranged my entire desktop this morning so there wouldn't be a lot of confusing icons on the screen. And now I am paying for that lack of foresight. There you go. Okay. 
So here is B Street. Let me magnify this a little. Here are some of the couple layers involved. If I turn off the sky, all of the skies, I usually work with a Cintiq, which means that the screen is a different size, too. I don't think this menu is going all the way to the bottom. Okay. All right. You can go away now. Hello. Uh, really? Okay. All right. Without the sky, these buildings look like this. I would have no idea to make anything on those buildings this color if it weren't for... Boy, I hope this isn't as tough. <laughs> Why is that happening? Hello. All right. If it weren't for this blue sky behind this building, I would have no idea what color to make anything. So the first thing I do is turn off you know, is turn off everything except for the background and do that. And then I draw the buildings into the background because the sky and the light in the background tells me everything I need to know about what color everything else is going to be. Um, another thing I would say is that when you're talking about my color sense in general, contrast has a lot to do with why things work. And I don't just mean contrast between light and dark. I mean contrast between saturated and unsaturated color. It's very important to have both in a drawing. Saturation, I mean, it's contrast between warm colors and cool colors. It's probably pretty important to have both. Even if you're, even if you're doing an underwater scene that's almost entirely blues, greens, and purples, there ought to be a little red and orange in it someplace, or yellow, something. Because something that has no warm in it or no cool in it is going to look monic chrome and kind of boring. Yeah. So I try and make sure there's saturation contrast, that there's color contrast, and that there's value contrast in everything I do. Um, uh, pretty much anything you could say about standard art theory would probably apply to digital art, and you have to know that stuff because the tool doesn't know it for you. Yeah. So I should go on to another question now. Yes. Thank you. Hey. Uh, I have a question about your time of day shifting 8-bit palette stuff where you change the color palette in order to do time of day, which is really cool. Thank you. Uh, how do you paint it when you're actually like in iteration on it, though? Okay. So what I do is I paint it, it in one time of day. I often just start with morning where, you know, all of the faces... For me, left is just sort of inherently east. West is kind of inherently right. Um, I just have all the light coming from the left-hand side of the picture, and I render it that way. But then, if I have a stretch of a rock pinnacle, for instance, that has, first of all, I use very few colors. When, I, when I'm doing that, pretty much everything except the sky is three to seven colors for whatever the structure is. Is this because of palette limitations? You because of palette limitations, and here's why. If I want sunlight to hit the top of that rock spire, and then uh, during the day move down, in the morning there's going to have to be a, a highlight side that looks like it's got three colors in it. But each of those three colors is actually going to have to have a dithered gradient of five other colors in it. So that some, you have five colors that all look like the same color in the morning, but as the light changes, some of these colors get darker or lighter and change hue. So you're actually going to have a whole bunch of colors in that one little strip of highlight taupe um, that are going to have to change at different times of day. So if I'm using more than three to seven colors for any object times four or five iterative colors inside each one of those colors, we're talking about a huge number of colors for this little rock spire. So no matter what feature I'm drawing except for the sky, it probably doesn't have more than seven colors in it, and if possible, five or three. For sky, I use 16 to 32 colors max. I do that so that the dither won't be as apparent. If you really want to hide dither, the way to do it is a long gradient where the difference between this color and the next color in the dither gradient is so subtle that people don't see it clearly. Um, so sky I use more things for, and then I try to reserve half the palette for color cycling effects. Half the palette will be 
color cycling ramps that can't obviously be used anywhere else in the drawing, or you know, trees and buildings would be flashing strangely. So I have to use half the palette for that, which means another reason to constrain all of the static parts of the picture to as few colors as possible. Does that answer your question yeah. at all? Well, do you paint with one palette at a time so you can actually see positional, like red is eastward and blue is westward? Like, do you paint with those types of palettes? What I did was I, I would make one picture and then I would move it to a different time of day and I would render it at that different time of day and I would just keep doing that to this one file until I had done it to the entire cycle. I would usually start in the morning and go through the day till evening. And each time I go to a new time of day, there's a few more things I need to add to the picture to do that. But I do also a very simple map of the picture first, just, you know, very solid color blocked out picture so that I can have some sense of what I'm going to need light to climb down on because if I know that I'm going to need light to hit this first and then this and it's a need to climb down these surfaces or up these surfaces right from the start I you know when I go to put in that highlight color I don't just put in the highlight color I can actually just fill it with a gradient of five colors knowing that I'm going to need to you know they're all the same color now they look like one color but I'm going to need to change them as time goes by does that make sense yeah it does okay great Thank you. Yes. Hi. You said you did all your dithering uh, by hand, pixel by pixel. Is there any kind of methodology or mental process you use when you're creating that? Or yeah, it would be difficult to explain verbally right now. But basically, I mean, I you know, back in the EGA days, I was doing most of that by hand too. If you're using a pattern that repeats, obviously, you make that pattern once and you stamp it down as brushes. But a lot of times, um, let's see here. When you're doing something like this, obviously in areas like these, there isn't any repeating pattern for you to use. So the idea there is that you start with a checkerboard and then it's every second pixel and then it's, and you move up and you're always adding a pixel. Each time you want the dither to be more diffuse, you're adding a pixel vertically and a pixel uh, horizontally to your spaces. And that just creates a kind of branching pattern that reads fairly smoothly. Back in the days we did this, CTR monitors were so blurry that we actually counted on the blur to sort of fill those colors in and blend them for us. That's no longer an option either. But um, it didn't look quite this dotty back then, but uh, it was still an improvement. So there is, however, something that I do, and I, I'm really glad you asked this question, in the 8-bit-ish art that I forgot to mention. Uh, even though it's all on my outline, I, I, I make an outline and then I leave it home, usually. I brought it this time, at least. That's a step forward. Um, I actually create dither templates first. Uh, remember when I was talking about making lighting templates and then I just select the layer? Well, I select the lighting template layer and I, I use a magic wand selection of the center circle and then I go back to the wall and I just add some yellow to it and then I select both inner circles and add some more yellow to it. Well, I do the same thing with dither a lot of times. There's a lot of times when you just need straight banded dither or you need a straight kind of circular dither pattern or a particular light shape of dither and when, you, when, there's, when there's a dither sort of pattern like that that you're going to need a lot of times, you can just make it in grays, in a grayscale dither, and keep it as a file someplace, and then you can drag it in as a layer and put it you know, on the layer above or below this, and you can just select one of those colors and then go back to your layer and move color balance or HSV around until you get the color you want, and then you select the next color in your dither pattern and just in, if you want me, to, if you want to see me do this, I'll I'll do it in a it minute later. That's actually very. Um, but that way, you can actually very quickly dither a large area with horizontal or circular dither, because of course Photoshop does not have dither gradient fills. Uh, they just didn't see that coming, I guess. Thank you. So yeah. Yes. Uh, g'day. I just had a question. I guess it was kind of more centered on EGA technology. Uh, so that's a very good screenshot for it. Um, when you're working with colors uh, in the EGA palette, which is 16 colors, mm -hmm. uh, in an 8x8 eight eight pixel chunk, is it similar to like the Commodore 64 where you're only limited to using two or four colors of that palette? Or can you use any of the 16 colors in that 8x8 eight eight pixel chunk? And if it's the former, how do you plan around that in your artwork? Uh, you're talking about EGA environment here? Or, yeah. or 
and EGA, okay, so EGA, you could use any of those 16 colors anywhere in the picture. Ah, okay, cool. CGA, which came before it, you were limited to four colors per little chunk of the picture. Ah, okay. But when we went to EGA, we could put all 16 of those colors, all beautiful 16 of those colors, anywhere we wanted to in that picture, cool. whether we liked it or not. Cheers, thanks very much. Yes. Yes. First of all, I wanted to say you're really inspiring to me. When Thank I was you. a little kid, my dad actually showed me some of your art, and it was just so mesmerizing and amazing to me. And now that I'm a little older, I want to start working on like pixel art and stuff seriously. So I was curious if you like had any advice for someone who's just getting into it, and like what are the best programs to start learning? Right now, the best program I can think of is Promotion by Cosmigo. If any of you are interested in sort of keeping track of what Joe Huckabee is doing, because I think he will be producing an, a, a, a far more flexible tool sometime next year. Uh, his Twitter handle is just jhuckabee, that's J-H-U-C-K-A-B-Y, and he may have a better tool for you next year. Uh, in terms of other advice, you know, I would basically say one of the great things about using 8-bit art today as digital artists is that in the old days, we were trying to create a commercial product with commercial imperatives within a very narrow time frame and within a very limited uh, bunch of storage capacity. There was a whole lot of things you had to do and you had to do very quickly. The beautiful thing about doing 8-bit art today is that nobody really needs you to do this in some commercial template to a certain schedule and within certain limitations, which means you're doing this for yourself. So take it as far as you can take it. You know, do what you love. We couldn't do what we love in those days. I did all sorts of things I could love. And Ron rushed in and told me why, for technical reasons, I could not do that. So that was the experience. You don't have that today, so really enjoy the freedom of doing 8-bit art in an age that doesn't need 8-bit art, just wants it. That's you know, that, like marriage, it's better to need your partner than to, I mean, better to want your partner than to need her. <laughs> My wife is in this audience too, sorry Shannon, I'll get this right someday. Um, <clears throat> it's better to want your partner than to need them, well, it's better to want to do EGA art than it was to need to do e EGA art, I mean, 8-bit uh, art back when we did it. So, anybody else got any other questions? No? Then I am actually going to uh, check to make sure I haven't left anything really crucial out of my 8-bit-ish. Um, oh, yeah, I was going to show you this. Uh, I'm putting glasses on over my glasses. Someday you'll be this old, too. Don't laugh too hard. Okay, I don't know why that's happening, but it's really annoying me. Hmm. Okay, so underneath this, I have this. This is a dither template. And hopefully that's big enough that you can see. How that's arranged. On top of it, I just have a solid color. So if I want to apply dither to that color, I just select this, tap it with the wand, go back to this. I'm going to hide the selection for a moment. And then I will just slide it to the color that I want. And then I will go back down to this gradient and tap it with the magic wand and go back to the layer I'm dithering, hide the selection so I can see what I'm doing, and then go back. And this is ever so much easier to do with a Wacom stylus than it is with a mouse. Then I'll go back, tap the next layer of dither, hide the selection, and do the color I want. And I can just go straight up. That way I don't have to place a single pixel with the pencil tool. I've already done that. And I can create these dither templates in ProMotion. I can just fill a screen with an actual gradient fill and turn it, save it as a BMP and drag it into Photoshop to use as a template here. So I never actually had to create these templates by hand. I let ProMotion do that. Uh, the only problem you're going to get into is in a, in a room where you have dither in all sorts of funny shapes. One of the great things that Promotion and Depaint and tools that were made for index color art have is they have gradient fills, including a contour fill that will fill conforming to the shape of the space you're trying to fill in a variety of different ways. There is no way to do that in Photoshop except doing it by hand uh, or taking that shape into Promotion, 
as a BMP, filling that shape with a contour gradient filled air, saving it as a BMP, bringing it back and using that as a template. Uh, you won't be able to, you, it probably won't be in the colors you actually want it to be, but it'll make a nice template for you to arrange those colors with uh, um, color balance and um, hue value saturation slider bars. So, um, so, okay. So I am going to now talk about the effects I did with color cycling. Um, I'm going to kill Photoshop and hope it comes up well when, if we use it again. So uh, I'm going to go back to Joe Huckabee's website. Okay. So, um, first of all, this moving moire of a waterfall um, in here. I'm going to sort of show you how that was laid out and done, because there are a number of things you would need to know. laid plans of mice and men. Now, okay, why isn't promotion opening this file? There we go. Okay. This is how you make a waterfall. First, you start with a template to pour a contour gradient into, a vertical contour gradient in this point. You're going to want that vertical contour to repeat. Now, the way to control the speed of your motion is with the length, not the speed of the gradient. So, for instance, as the water first starts over the falls here, it looks like it's moving very slowly. By the time it's pouring down the front of the falls, it looks like it's moving much more rapidly. The speed of the gradient isn't changing. That's all one gradient at one speed. But by putting that gradient in very short little segments, it only has to move, that, that color shift only has to move three pixels of vertical distance. Down here, that color shift needs to move five, ten pixels of vertical distance. It has to all happen in the same period of time, so that color shift is going to happen faster in a long gradient than it is in a short gradient. So you're going to use vertical stuff to control your speed. So you want the things at the top to be shorter vertically and the, and the spaces at the bottom to be longer vertically while you fill it with that uh, contour gradient so that your waterfall pours slowly over the lip and then picks up speed as it falls. Secondly, these little yellow bands in here are to bridge the seam between these gradients. If you just make different segments and pour the same gradient into it, the, the transition between each color in that cycling gradient is dithered until you reach the end of the gradient. Then there's this sharp cutoff between the last color in the gradient and the first color in the gradient. And if you leave it that way, there will be this knife edge line where things flash in the middle of this otherwise smooth movement. So you actually need to fill those little yellow margins with a vertical gradient and put the top half, fill the top half with the last color of the gradient above it and fill the bottom half with the first color in the gradient below it so that there is never a point at which you just have a hard edge between one color and the next. Uh, so that's what I'm doing in these first four things. I'm putting in, I'm filling this with the bottom color and this with the top color. Then you want to create a checkerboard. To create the semblance of transparency, transparency is something you don't have in an 8-bit art file uh, usually, at least you certainly didn't when we worked with them. So you create a, uh, a checkerboard dither. And you fill one of the colors with, your, with the pattern, the cycling pattern you just made. And then you move it over slightly, and you fill the other color with it. 
So every other pixel is showing you one iteration of that cycling texture you just made, and the pixels in between are showing you a different one. And that way, you can sort of cross this pattern with itself to get this sort of moving moray that you see over here. So one pattern transparently over another by simply filling the two patterns that you want to be transparent into every other pixel. Then you're going to create that very same pattern remapped to the very to different gradients with the same number of colors moving at the same speed in the same direction but slightly shifted in value and hue. And you're doing this to shade your waterfall. You'll notice that this gradient is very pale up here. It's very dark down here. It looks like I've rendered the gradient somehow. Well, the way I've actually done that is to create that very same pattern in gradients of equal length and speed and direction. And then I've just created another sort of template. You use stencils to put the light gradient in over this color and the next medium gradient in over this yellow color and the next and the next, so that your gradient ends up. It's the very same pattern. It's all identical except for the color, so now you have the pattern uninterrupted while the color changes. From there, you put it in its environment. So you stick that in there in the rocks, and it looks, uh, it looks pretty straight-edged for a waterfall. So you fill the edges you want to be full of falls with another stencil color here, a color that's nowhere else in your drawing, so you can fill it easily. And you take this really dark iteration of the very same pattern and you just stencil it into the edges. Now, that dark pattern has the, uh, the, the actual gradient in the palette has been arranged with cliff colors and fall colors a bit in about equal amounts. So once you stencil that with the rock colors and the fall colors in equal amounts into these green spaces here, the result is that when, when the gradient shows the fall colors, it'll look like that part of it is joined to the falls, and when it shows the rock colors, it'll look like that part of it is joined to the rocks, and it'll make the edges of the fall seem to waver between the rocks and the fall. And then you create some, you know, some water down here. This particular falls was done for a game that was actually not just 8-bit, it was a character set game. So these were all actually characters that you could just pick up and stamp down on a grid to make any kinds of falls. Now you're going to make the foam at the bottom. You do that by creating a contour gradient fill into a pattern like this and then remapping those things. So like this, this is the, the boiling foam at the bottom of the falls, but because I've just filled it with the same gradient, you can see how it flashes, dark light, dark light. That's because the gradient is all happening in all of these little cells at the same time, and that doesn't look very good. So once you've created that thing, you create a, what I used to call a clown color stencil, like this, and you fill a couple of those cells with the same number of clown colors as there are in your, in your cycling gradient, and you map those cycling colors to your gradient. And then, then you, f you, you remap them with the gradient so that those cells look like this. And then you, uh, you take some more cells and you map them in the same clown colors, but this time you remap them so that whatever was the center color in the last one, you start two colors up your gradient and remap them. So that here in, in this uh, cell, it's, it's starting with color number one in that cycling gradient. But in this cell, it's going to start with color number three. And you remap those cells. And then you repeat the process. And in the end, instead of this flashing gradient that goes bright light, bright light, bright light, you have this one where the different cells are going bright and dark at different times so that the overall mass doesn't just flash at you. I hope that made sense. 
If it didn't, I am going to be doing more Q&A and going to the Q&A. Well, actually, we have this room for a little longer, so anybody who wants to stay at 1130, I'll continue answering questions, and you can say, I didn't understand a thing you said. Try again. So to do mist, same sort of thing. I create a clown color template to fill in with color cycling gradient. I create a color cycling gradient that will go over the falls and a color cycling gradient that will go over the rock spaces. I did this with a gradient fill distorted, which is something you can do in an actual 8-bit tool pretty easily, usually. And then I filled in those clown colors with those gradients so it looks like this. And then because this was all done on character boundaries, I was able to... Um, see if I can get my menu here. I was able just to pick this up. Oh, helps if you have a grid on. Okay, no I'm not. Yeah, there we go. So I was able to pick this up and Yeah, all right, never mind. And flip it and make a waterfall of my own. It's been a while since I've used a lot of these tools, in case you couldn't tell. So that's how I made a waterfall. Now I'm going to go through some of these other things very quickly. Actually, it's 12.30. If you want to stay, I'm going to go through some more of these scenes and tell you what I did to make these things. If you need to go, thank you very much for coming. And uh, I hope it was worth something. Thank you. So apparently there's not another session in this room till 2 o'clock. I am not going to stay here till 2 o'clock, don't worry. But uh, I will stay for up to another half an hour talking as long. Feel free to leave anytime you want. Um, I will not take it personally. So with the snow here, um, I'm actually going to open D-Paint in a DOS box now. This should be very entertaining, even more entertaining than my use of more recent tools. So with the snow, what you're actually seeing is this. So you're actually seeing a snow pattern that looks like this. It is one gradient of about seven colors where all the colors are tuned to a single color except for one palette position that is tuned to a snow color. Then, I'm going to lay it over the picture like this, only I'm going to identify color families in this picture, dark browns, dark greens, grays, whites, and I'm going to create, so right now, you see I have a whole bunch of these uh, cycling gradients. They are all the same length, they are all the same speed, the snow color is positioned at the same spot in all of them. Now I am going to Now you can see where the, the different gradients come and go. Now I am going to map those gradients so that gradients that look the same You can see that although these gradients will all have the same white dot in them, gradients where the rest of the gradient is dark brown will go over all of the dark brown or black areas. Gradients that are dark gray will go over all of the green areas. And I'm just going to copy that same pink pattern you saw, only colored appropriately, using a stencil and the grid function so that they're always laid down exactly and aligned with the others using a stencil for just those colors I want to cover, I'm just going to stamp that pattern down five or six times over this whole picture. And the result will be this. And here I've left a couple of the colors unstenciled so you can sort of see them. If you're looking now, and, and down here, I would need to do another gradient to do these browns because it's, it's kind of showing right now. If you're looking, you can actually see those stripes all throughout the picture, but because the, all the colors in the gradient except for the snow color are so similar to those static background colors they are up against, it looks 
without looking very carefully, as if you've got little white dots moving transparently over a space when, in fact, they're embedded in it. So I cannot actually get out of this DOS box without doing this. Now I can get out of the DOS box. These are part of the problems with the dearth of tools here. So I can't magnify this anymore, but if you really look now, you will actually see little trails of background color. I've just made sure that the background is filigree enough so that those trails will not actually be very visible. So that's what's going on there. That's what's going on with the rain here. It's the same thing. And there, this, that seawater was the same thing as the waterfalls. This moray pattern here, I, I, there's something called the, the wavering edge. Remember in the waterfalls where I filled the edges of the waterfall with a gradient that was half the color of the rocks and half the color of the waterfall? I'm making the fish flap their tails and everything here. I'm making these corals and things seem to waver around by just putting a one to two pixel edge on them and filling it with a linear cycling gradient fill that is half the color of the coral or the fish and half the color of the water around it. So it makes those shapes seem to waver. Uh, it's the same thing I do with um, a reflection in a pond. So you see how the mountain seems to waver and the trees seem to waver there. That's, that's static art that simply has a one to two pixel outline on it and is filled with gradients that are half the, the color of the image that's wavering and half the color of the background behind that image. And it makes everything appear to waver. It's also a really good way to do flames. So, for instance, in the... Uh, There isn't actually any way to view these things except on Joe Huckabee's little demonstration here, so I'm very grateful for it. So the flames in this scene. This is another place where the gradients in these flames are all different lengths and different speeds so that they move at different paces. If I had made them all, if I had made the, the light, the yellow, the light orange and the dark red gradients, all the same length and the same size, then these flames would have gone flash, flash, flash at you. But because of the fact that the yellows and the oranges and the reds are all moving at different speeds from each other, there isn't anything synced up to flash here, so it's just a fluid movement, movement that keeps going. This firelight on the back here, same kind of thing I did with the snowflakes, or the uh, waterfall actually, where the waterfall is light at the top and dark at the bottom. I just made I, I used a checkerboard dither to create this moray pattern by putting moving bars that were diagonal to the upper right into every other pixel of a checkerboard, and in the remaining pixels I made the same pattern move diagonal bars moving upper left. Then I took that texture and remapped it to five different gradients in five different colors, from a very light color in here to medium colors to these very dark colors out here. And when I had five identical pieces of texture in five different gradients of different colors, then I stenciled various parts of the rock and simply popped that cycling texture aligned with all of the others into the proper part of the rock, and you end up with this pattern moving over what seems to be a textured area. So, for instance... No, not that one. Mountain storm. Where is mountain storm? Up, up. Tell me when. Direct. There we are. Okay. So again, it looks like I have a transparent layer of moving cycling texture over these clouds, but I don't actually. If you took all the static cloud away, you discover that that's a solid piece of color cycling texture, but it is mapped to different values. So this is the very same pattern in a dark value here, and the very same pattern in a light value here, just remapped to the various clown colors of my general cloud sculpture behind them. So is that making sense? You understand what I'm saying? Great. Does anybody have specific questions about any of these color cycling effects you've seen so far that you want to ask? That I can... 
uh, back in the days when D-Paint worked and was a resolution to actually fill the screen and everything, um, depending on the complexity of the scene, it probably took somewhere between two days and a week and a half for one image. Uh, because some of this is very meticulous. It depended on what they wanted. You know, if they just wanted moving water, that probably took me a day and a half. If they wanted falling snow, that took a week and a half. You know, it depends on what you were trying to do. You can still make these in promotion. In fact, I'm going to try and get promotion to work again. Let's see. Yep. No. Come on, just, oh, screw it. Yeah, I don't know what's with my computer all of a sudden. I don't know why all my menus are insisting on being in the middle of the screen. That's new. Is it? Oh, it's probably because it's attached to whatever's projecting it. That's interesting. All right. Well, you'll still be able to see some of this. Okay, so that waterfall was actually done for this Spyro game, the waterfall that I demoed the construction of earlier. Jeez. Oh, this is really annoying. Oh, good. Look at, I moved it. So, um, these scenes were done in promotion. And, you know, you can see that I'm doing most of the, the same things. Now, these effects are a little cruder than the ones in the uh, landscapes I'm showing you in the Joe Huckabee demo because this was a character set game. So I not only had to do all of these things in the, in the palette constraints that I told you for a 256 color picture, but these scenes all had to be made out of 200 and some odd ca characters that were repeatable. So I, I couldn't even be free form with my 256 color palette. I had to do a little eight pixel by eight pixel characters out of which all of this was constructed. So, you know, here you see this moray pattern. I try to reserve half the palette. Um, again, going into the, uh, the demo here, uh, in this piece, the color cycling starts here. Everything from here down is color cycling. Everything. Most of this picture is not actually static color. So the, all of the static part of the picture is in these top four rows. Well, four and a half rows. I guess five rows. These top five rows are the whole picture. Going back to those storm photos. The entire picture for all of those scenes is that big. I didn't even use the rest of the palette because the, we were going to put color cycling, we did put color cycling effects over these pictures. You know, storm has a special power that raises the hurricane. Well, then we have wind blowing over them that's made visible in various ways. And all of those things were gonna require the rest of the palette. So all nine of these scenes use this much palette space. Um, for the, the scenes that you saw there. So yeah, you learn really quickly to make minimal use of colors, and I should have said this when everybody was still here, but um, what you really want is you want one to three highlight colors, and you want one to three shadow side colors, what I call bounce light colors, and you want one what I call turning edge color. So when an object is lit, the light hits it from one direction and that's the bright side of the object, some of that light misses the object and bounces off of things behind it and sort of lights up palely the backside and that's the shadow side of the object. And then there's this little zone down the middle of the object where light is hitting it neither from the light source or bouncing back from other things and that's what I call the turning edge. It's usually actually the darkest part of an object. So I have highlight colors, turning edge colors, and shadow side colors. Really sorry I didn't say that while everybody was still here. And um, at the very least, at these resolutions, you need one highlight color, one turning edge color, and one shadow side color. At the very most, you probably need three highlight colors, you know, three little iterations of the bright colors on the bright side, and three shadow side, and one still turning color. And I arrange them as turning color gradients. So,
Bye. That was my wife. I don't blow kisses to all of you. I'm just warning you now. Um, so you won't be disappointed. <clears throat> Let's see. I guess I'm going to have to do this in deep paint, actually. Back to DOS box. Okay, so in this picture, we're really only the watercolor cycles. I have all of these trees. And you can see that there are lighter colors over here, and there are some slightly lighter colors over here, and all the dark colors in the middle of the picture. So those trees are these colors probably right in here, or maybe actually I guess it's these colors in here, and I don't know, I can't make this any larger because it's deep paint, and that resolution used to fill a whole screen, and that's as big as it gets now. Um, but the, the side facing the light is over here, and then these are shadow colors. Now, these trees were really large, so I gave them some extra colors. But then there's the turning edge portion of the, of the ramp, and then there's these lighter colors at the side, which are the shadow side. And then I could just create a ramp like this, and I could create a, a tree trunk, and do a ridge gradient fill, and so when I fill that tree trunk with that, it just sort of comes pre-rendered. Do you see what I'm saying? So I don't have to render the highlight to the shadow. Um, it just sort of renders that automatically. I think I actually got parts of two gradients in here, which is why it looks funny folded. But I try and arrange my ramps from highlights through turning edge through shadow so I can do uh, gradient fills that just render a thing for me by filling it with a gradient instead of having to go in with the individual colors and, you know, color all that chiaroscuro. So now I'm going to hit Control-Alt-Delete to get out of DOSBox. Any other questions you have? Yeah. Yes. So this is more. Of, this is not really a question. This is more of. A, I just wanted to tell you that I think the artwork that you're doing is brilliant. I feel privileged to having been here and experienced this. Thank I just you. To tell you, I feel like we're looking at like a master of his time. And Where? I, really, <laughs> <laughs> I want to no, see him. No, I mean, I just had chill bumps watching this. So I just wanted to tell you that you know everyone here. I think I'm speaking on behalf of everyone here that this is masterful artwork and. I just feel privileged having got to see this. So thank, thank you, you so very much. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Well, thank you. I mean, when we did these originally, they mattered for really practical logistical reasons. Storage, processing time, refresh rates on screens, made doing full screen animations of environmental stuff like this impossible, um, this was the only way you could do this kind of animation. Now, of course, we live in a world where the resources are virtually infinite and getting more infinite all the time. So there is no compelling reason practically to be doing any of these things anymore. One of the reasons there are so few tools to do it in. But as an artistic, as a creative, expressive act, I think that it really does put you in a a space that nothing else does. So I applaud everybody who's actually going there to see what they can learn and what they can create. Because you end up taking the sensibilities and the kind of thinking processes with you back to those other tools. Are you waiting to ask a question? Yes. Oh, so uh, I said just like a really quick um, observation and then a practical question. So the observation, I've also been trying to think about why this is so visually compelling. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I, like I love this. I love, I love your work in this whole style. Thank you. Um, and I just had this thought while watching this that maybe some of it has to do with a kind of a crisp precision to the use of light that is very hard to do in um, 
you know, in, in 3D or in a lot of other media, like the treatment, like I've heard you talk about light a number of times um, in today, right? And like there's something about the way that light gets gets handled that makes me think actually about like photorealistic painting or, um, you know, some of the surrealists like Magritte or, or, or somebody like that that is very hard to do in other, um, you know, in other styles. But anyway, so the practical question is about the uh, the dither templates. Mm -hmm. So um, I have really, like a, I'm, I don't really have a lot of patience. So this is I guess why I've never really been successful at doing this style. But <laughs> so like that was revolutionary using this like the the dither template hue and color shift technique. And so then the thing that immediately then came to my mind, being lazy, is like could you write uh, like could I write some code that would then construct dither templates in different patterns and shapes and different styles? I have no doubt that would you that could. Like, in uh, fact, I've seen people do it. I, I had a friend once who actually wrote a tool that would allow me just to paint moving snow in actual color cycling over a scene. This tool actually registered what was beneath the mouse, what was beneath the cursor at any moment, and you created, you still had to create the, the cycling things, but it basically, as you went pixel by pixel over the screen, it just determined which of those gradients was the closest to the pixel you were over and just assigned this matched up dither pattern to those pixels as you went down and you could just paint falling snow over a scene in exactly the way I did except the machine did it for you. So there are undoubtedly ways to animate the tedious parts of this and it is tedious. It's tedious and it requires patience um, uh, or it requires exactly the kind of code and tools you're talking about. I suspect strongly that Joseph Huckabee's new pixel art tool will actually be providing opportunities to automate a lot of these things, as well as working in very high resolutions, as well as giving you access to layers of pixel art and other things that you know, are available in promotion, but um, sometimes rather awkwardly. Yeah, thanks. So, anybody else? You? Yes? Yeah. Hi. First, first of all, thank you so, so much for that information. I know that web page for a few years already, I, as far as I remember. I'm from demo scene, and I was pixeling uh, art in uh, on Commodore 64, Amiga, Atari ST. So I perfectly know, let's say, what we were talking about those uh, uh, low palette uh, modes and the low resolutions. Of course, I never been able to do such a beautiful graphics, especially color cycling. Uh, you were, and I was working on uh, using the um, promotion uh, um, software for GBA pixeling. Uh, while um, I could recommend, if you can check it out, there is additional freeware software for pixeling like Graphics 2, uh, GraphX uh, second. It's uh, free of charge and uh, it's really cool. So if you want to check it out, it's great. And uh, once again, thank you. And I'm waiting for that new tool for a pixeling. Yeah, well, keep, uh, keep a watch on Joe Huckabee because that's where it'll be coming from. And I, I certainly am going to be interested when it's accessible. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Do you know if uh, Huckabee's new tool is going to allow for plugins and extensions so that you can actually? Well, the amazing thing, the great, the reason that this tool doesn't exist right now is that Joe's day job has pretty much prevented it. Uh, Joe's going to be taking a hiatus from that day job in just a couple months. At that point, Joe is an independent developer and a very accessible person. And I am pretty sure that Joe would welcome any input from anybody who has things they're hoping the tool will do, or hoping the tool will include, or helping the tool will improve on. So I cannot tell you for sure everything that's currently in the tool Joe's working, but I can tell you he's a brilliant guy who, if anybody can incorporate input, knows, is going to know how to incorporate input. It'll be Joe. And if you are looking for specific features, I encourage you to tweet him or uh, you know, find him in the... Uh, sure out there in the cyber frontier someplace and tell him what it is you're looking for because now is exactly the time when he could use that information. Sounds great. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Yes? Um, I just a quick question about um, your setup in Photoshop. Like, what's the canvas size? Like, what? Ah. Like well, for this project, we are trying to create a game that looks at about the same resolutions. So our, our screens actually have several resolutions, but... They are anywhere from 128 pixels high to 428 pixels high, and the width is dependent upon what's happening from side to side in the screen. Uh, but they are, they are similar to the 640 by 480 kind of resolution that we last saw 
in the age of 8-bit indexed color games. Some of them are similar to the 320 by 200 kind of resolution we had back in the 80s. Uh, so for screen size, was there another part of your question that I missed? I guess how you have Photoshop set up so that you get the best result, because, you know, Photoshop, you can, I guess, make your own custom templates. And well, when I do the original sketch, I make sure that I'm creating a new file that is, you know, 128 pixels high and 400 and something 80 pixels wide, and then I draw in that with the pencil tool. So as, lo as long as the... As long as the file you're starting on is the right resolution, uh, a pixel will be that size automatically. And again, you're going to be using only the pencil tool, not the brush tool, and anti-aliasing and in, uh, will be turned off everywhere, and nearest neighbor interpolation will be turned on everywhere. Does that mean it's time to stop? Five minutes. Great. Okay, so I need to be out of here in five minutes. They've been extremely generous to let me go over this far. And... Um, if there's any urgent questions, I will go over to the alcove, not the one straight across from the room, but down the hall for a little bit to continue talking more close up and face to face with anybody here who wishes to do that. Otherwise, thank you so much for all of this time and attention. I appreciate it very much.